Hi, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Mark Cohen. Uh, I'm an emeritus professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic and an adjunct professor of medicine at National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado, and I'm very pleased to be with you uh, to discuss advances in safety and efficacy of the TNF inhibitors in 2011. This is one of the rheumatology highlight reports, and it's um, my uh, honor to uh, share some information with you. The information is based on selections of uh, new material, and uh, I hope you'll find it as interesting as uh, I have. Um, my uh, intent here is to discuss three main uh, topics uh, that I will separate out for you. The first is this concept of induction and maintenance in early rheumatoid arthritis, a concept I find quite interesting. Um, there, I'm going to present several abstracts that um, sort of use this principle um, with the conclusion afterwards that in some patients, after successful induction with aggressive combination therapy, the continuous use of biologics may not be necessary in all patients. The first study that really looked at this uh, that I've chosen is uh, called the Optima trial. Um, this is a trial of uh, 207 uh, patients uh, out of a group of 466 with early rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and they were randomized to two groups, uh, either adalimumab plus methotrexate or um, methotrexate plus a placebo. But we're going to discuss that 207 or 44% of those patients who then achieved a DAS of less than 3.2 at week 26. So this is all from the adalimumab plus methotrexate group who achieved a DAS at, uh, at less than 3.2 at week 26. Interestingly, then, they were randomized to continue methotrexate with placebo or continue methotrexate with adalimumab. So in a sense, we're sort of stepping down therapy for half the group after they responded to combination. We're stepping down to either methotrexate alone or continuing on the uh, combination. Very interestingly, the uh, group that received methotrexate plus placebo did almost as well as the combination of uh, the TNF uh, inhibitor and methotrexate, and uh, this uh, continued through uh, 78 weeks. You can see the clinical data there, and then I would also um, urge you to look at the total SHARP score data, where that change was also very small. And this seemed to indicate that after achieving a remission, it was possible to withdraw the adalimumab in some selected patients. So an interesting concept. Um, a slight different, uh, different approach to this is uh, in the next slide, uh, where in a uh, study from the, the Leeds group um, presented uh, by NAM et al., um, we looked at, or excuse me, they looked at 54 early rheumatoid arthritis patients who were randomized to receive infliximab plus methotrexate or IV methylprednisolone, then escalated um, with uh, other combination drugs, including methotrexate or sulfasalazine and hydroxychloroquine or even leflutamide. Um, so the, the subsequent therapy isn't as important in this presentation as the induction principle. So we have two different kinds of induction in this study. IV methylprednisolone or the TNF antagonist plus methotrexate. And although this study is not finished, the early conclusion at 26 weeks was that early and sustained remission rates were achieved with both intensive or early uh, sort of induction uh, strategies. So, so a different approach um, is giving us sort of a similar um, conclusion, but this time in the induction phase. The uh, third study to be discussed briefly is the German trial. Uh, this looked at methotrexate plus adalimumab um, versus uh, methotrexate alone, and then they stepped down the first group. So although they were initially treated with a combination of methotrexate and tuber uh, necrosis factor inhibition, they were then stepped down to only methotrexate. Uh, we have clinical data here, and it did appear that the combination of methotrexate and the TNF antagonist was superior to methotrexate alone, but then... Uh, when they were both stepped down, it also appeared that methotrexate was able to maintain their response even in radiographic progression, a key point then from the German study. The next study to be, to be discussed uh, briefly is a, a Dutch trial that is not the best trial. Finally, something else uh, published besides best. Um, this time, a small group of rheumatoid arthritis patients induced, if you would, with this combination of methotrexate and infliximab, and then in about um, 
more than 50% of the patients, they were able to lower the infliximab dose. In 16%, they were able to stop it. In 45%, they were able to lower it, uh, interestingly called de-escalation in this trial. So it did seem that once the patients achieved low disease activity, it w they were able to either lower or discontinue the TNF antagonist in this study, infliximab. The next trial was a Japanese trial that really did the same thing. This time, patients treated with adalimumab plus methotrexate. Um, then the uh, adalimumab was withdrawn if they were able to induce uh, low disease activity. Uh, of the original 156, uh, 40 patients received um, changes in adalimumab because they had a clinical response of a DAS less than 2.6. So in this trial, again, after achieving uh, clinical remission with a combination of the TNF antagonist and methotrexate, they were able to take away the TNF antagonist, maintain the response with methotrexate alone um, with uh, low numbers at uh, 12 weeks, but again, uh, maintaining responses with um, methotrexate alone. So this looked at this uh, group of uh, really abstracts or trials, some not completed, um, that all seem to uh, at least uh, deal with the concept of induction, aggressive treatment of early disease, and then the ability to use different medications, often methotrexate, uh, with regards to maintenance. Interesting concept. We'll have to look carefully to see uh, how long clinical and radiographic responses can be maintained. Well, I'd like to move to uh, safety issues, and these are uh, trials we can go through even more uh, quickly because their points are very clear. Um, with regards to TNF antagonists and malignancy, again, uh, there is reassurance of no increase in solid tumors, although there is an interesting abstract I'll discuss uh, regarding melanoma risk. Uh, in addition, uh, the whole concept of TNF uh, antagonism and infection, um, uh, to add to our sort of knowledge of this risk, um, I'll talk about an abstract that looked at opportunistic infections and herpes infections, which were both uh, increased in, in uh, careful reviews of uh, large uh, patient cohorts. So that first trial I'd like to discuss um, is the um, British registry, a very uh, nice uh, registry um, from uh, the British group that has uh, been mined previously to give us some very important information. This time they looked at their uh, complete uh, group of uh, TNF antagonist patients and could find no uh, increase in the solid tumors of any kind. Uh, the risk did not vary with duration of follow-up. And uh, they have uh, most of these patients treated with uh, a TNF antagonist uh, for more than five years. Uh, the second trial was a meta-analysis of the 29 randomized controlled trials from the French group uh, looked at the pooled risk of malignancy and found it to be 0 0.8 with confidence intervals that were not too wide. Again, exposure did not increase risk. Uh, no matter how they analyzed their uh, studies, they did not change the conclusion. So they have a rather powerful, if you like, meta-analyses uh, conclusion that, again, there's no overall increased risk of malignancy. Um, the... Um, the trial that looked at melanoma um, was, again, uh, from another very nice registry that we've discussed previously, the Swedish Artis Registry, where they looked carefully for the relative risk of malignant my melanoma in their biologics group and found that to be 1.1, so a very slight uh, increase, um, slightly um, uh, higher than that when they broke their uh, patient groups down and included in situ melanoma. Again, they concluded that compared to melanoma, the relative risk of all other cancers uh, was less than one. So no overall risk in their entire group uh, when malignancy was uh, uh, analyzed, but a slight increase, a uh, slightly higher risk of malignant melanoma. So uh, those are the... Um, sort of best um, reviews of uh, new data regarding uh, infection and, uh, I'm sorry, regarding malignancy and TNF antagonists. Um, there was a dissenting uh, paper presented of a very small group of uh, patients from Australia where they did find an increased risk. The author of that uh, particular abstract was um, Van, Doom, uh, Van Dorman. At least she presented the data. Um, and uh, she commented that although they found a significant increase, um, 
they, they urged caution and interpretation because they didn't control for disease severity, um, and um, clearly they were discussing the possibility of uh, some uh, selection bias uh, in their results. So I think large registries continue then to give us some reassurance regarding solid tumors uh, uh, and uh, TNF antagonists. Um, the, the next topic is uh, TNF and infection. Uh, we'll lead off with the British group again, who uh, examined uh, their large uh, cohort of patients on biologics and concluded that the absolute rate of opportunistic infections was slightly higher. This did not achieve uh, statistical significance. Um, and they also found a slightly higher increase of opportunistic infections in uh, the infliximab group when the different biologics uh, were uh, analyzed. So uh, important data, I think this time uh, looking at a group of patients um, where we needed some uh, further uh, confidence, and that is this opportunistic infection uh, question, which we really have um, considered previously. We have a high um, threshold for um, I'm sorry, we have a low threshold for thinking about it, a high threshold for um, being aggressive uh, in our uh, workup of uh, any patient uh, on a biologic who has infectious symptoms. Uh, the next slide, again, is a meta-analysis uh, looking at uh, multiple uh, trials, <coughs> 21 articles and 29 abstracts, um, and concluding here that there is an increased risk of herpes zoster, uh, they analyzed all patients with inflammatory rheumatic disease, that's the IRD abbreviation. So an increase in herpes zoster infections uh, in the TNF in, in a inhibitor group. Um, and, and this, um, of course, raises the question of uh, whether our patients um, should be vaccinated. The, the, I think the answer is yes, how to get that done, uh, particularly in the United States, uh, will be a, an interesting challenge for everyone. So more data regarding safety. Um, I think it was very interesting. I'd like to move on even more quickly to the question of uh, dosing issues in TNF inhibitors. There were two uh, abstracts presented with the conclusion that uh, perhaps TNF responses were not as good in patients with higher BMIs. Um, I think that's an interesting uh, thought, uh, perhaps then explaining why, why TNF antagonists don't work in all patients. Uh, the first was a paper uh, by Smolin et al., uh, with the conclusion uh, after a, a retrospective review with some uh, study data that patients with higher BMIs had uh, an obviously a diminished clinical response uh, in this uh, particular abstract to uh, etanercept. Uh, the next study um, was uh, a post hoc study as well, this time looking at the infamous BEST trial, again with the conclusion that patients with higher BMIs had a diminished clinical response in this uh, particular analysis to infliximab. So I think we have BMI now as a variable we might need to consider when we think about dosing. The other question that remains out there that I discussed last time is whether or not patients are developing antibodies that block responses, which might also explain why some patients don't respond or don't continue to respond to TNF inhibitors. Uh, my last uh, slide is really about uh, other interesting reports. I'll just take you through this uh, one at a time. Uh, the first um, is just a reminder of how um, this whole uh, topic of proteomics and genomics is uh, advancing quickly. Uh, this was looking at prote uh, pro protein array screening, um, predicting lack of response to TNF therapy in patients with RA. Um, several abstracts um, looking at other kinds of uh, gene products or genes. Um, this is obviously the future, and uh, progress is being made. The next two studies mentioned have to do with the fact that golimumab appears to be as good subcutaneously as it uh, is uh, intravenously, uh, so that may become available in the States. And then the fourth bullet about a tenorcept inducing a decrease, a decrease in left ventricular mass, possibly explaining some of the positive effects that TNF inhibitors might have on cardiovascular disease. And lastly, just to bring us back to uh, Earth, uh, another trial from a smaller group in Sweden that discussed how difficult it is to achieve remission and sustain remission in patients treated with TNF inhibitors. So just when we thought we were doing great, there's a caution. And I agree, I think we need to be cautious. I think we still need to think about whether or not we're treating our patients uh, with the uh, best uh, combinations. Um, think about the concept of induction and maintenance. Think about the concept of 
um, whether uh, some patients don't respond because of uh, antibodies or because of high BMI, and continue to uh, be vigilant about safety issues and TNF inhibitors. Well, that concludes my uh, brief presentation. I very much enjoyed being with you. Um, uh, let me know if uh, you want to discuss this further. Uh, otherwise, I'll uh, see you next time. Thanks.